more intellectual word than to describe you as like being super dope, right? And having conversations. <laughs> and then you can being able to have like these early conversations with my mom when I didn't know what the law was. All I thought what it was is like an ex-boyfriend and ex-girlfriend fighting over some contract dispute or something. But this was one of like the early seeds that was planted for me, and I think for a lot of people in this room too. So I feel personally honored and have so much joy and pleasure to introduce Judge Hatchet. Thank you. Oh, what a joy it is to be in this place. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. And so to you, Brother Chair, Madam President, um, to my um, baby brother, Joey Jackson, because I've adopted him into my family. I'm really old enough to be his mother, to be his, you know, I should probably say my son, Joey Jackson. Um, who I have so much respect for, both personally and professionally. We've been through a lot together. He has stood with me in the personal storm of my daughter tragically dying at 16. He was there. He came from New York. He was there with me. And we have been on so many CNN, HLN panels, and, you know, or I'll call him up and say, I'm on CNN in 30 minutes. Tell me what to say, Joey, and he'll tell me. <laughs> it's the other way around. <laughs> so I'm thrilled. I am. Um, we have the former president of the National Bar Association. Please stand up. <laughs> I thank you. I thank you for being here. I thank you for your presence alone. Just reinforces your commitment to all of us. And I thank you. I'm Beverly McQuarrie Smith. I was president of the National Bar Association in 98-99. This is my law school, where I got my first law degree. I got my second law degree from Harvard, the same one that Michelle and Barack Obama attended. President Smith, see, so you didn't have to be here today, but it speaks volumes of your commitment, your continuing commitment, um, to all of us, and especially aspiring lawyers. Um, I'm not going to be really long today, but um, my heart is full. It is, because as I walked into this building this afternoon and to see so many of you, um, it just reminded me of the powerful potential that is there among all of us. And so I am particularly excited today to have two young people who interned with me uh, one who is a lawyer now, Marcus Sandifer, please stand up. Emory um, University Law School grad this past spring, and Kiara Ortiz, who graduated from Spelman year before last, took a year off. A gap year with us. Um, she saw the press conference about Orlando Castile, knew that I was representing that family on the civil case, and she called and said, you know, can I come and join the team? And now she is a one out. So you see, I mean, it's just, I'm so enormously proud of both of them. And so I'm, and I'm so happy that you both are here this morning, this afternoon. Um, I'm a storyteller. I debated Joey about whether to tell this story because it's not going to sound good, but there's a powerful message in this story. And it's the day that I almost quit law school. You know, and I actually told that story in the first chapter of my most recent book because I needed to put it out there. I needed to just, you know, I need to be transparent. I try to live my truth. I try to speak truth to power. And then you're going to go, damn, why is she telling the that story, right? <laughs> now, we're we trying to get into law school. She going to come up here and talk about when she almost dropped out of law school. But work with me on this. I promise you, there's a powerful lesson in the story. So when I went to Emory, I didn't have the benefit of this. I didn't have a pre-law pre -law conference. I mean, I just was, you know, applying to law school. Madam President Smith, on a wing and a prayer, I, I came from a family who was rich in blessings, but did not have money. There were no 
nobody in my family had gone to law school. And so I didn't have anyone to shepherd me through this process. I didn't. You know, I didn't have an internship. I didn't, I, I was just doing it. Um, and I didn't have this collective rich experience. So I'm, I'm so thrilled that, that this is happening. So I'm in law school. I am working full time. Yes. Full time. And there was not a part-time option at Emory Law School, so I was going to law school full-time. And full here, didn't have enough sense to get a job where I could maybe, you know, work in the library and study a little bit or, you know, wait some tables and, you know, just not have to have a heavy-duty lift mentally, right? But I know full here is the assistant dean for women in the undergrad school, right? Crazy. Crazy. So I have responsibility for the entire women's complex, 300 students. One night, I'm all, I'm all night Joey in the ER with one of my students who had been raped. You know, one night I had to go and, 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 and wake one of my students up to tell her that her father had been killed in a car accident. I mean, this was heavy duty stuff. And then I'd have some crazy chick coming in my, she didn't call it chick, young woman. <laughs> coming, you know, talking about, oh, I need to talk to you, I need to talk to you. My boyfriend quit me and has left me for my sorority sister. You know, look, I got real life issues I deal with. I'm trying to do torts and contracts. I'm trying to understand these theories. I'm trying to understand constitutional law. I really don't care about your boyfriend. You know, I can't quite say it quite like that. You know, but I say, you know, really, you're better off. <laughs> you don't need him, and you don't need her. I want to say, look, get a grip. <laughs> but it was deep. You know, I was really trying to balance being in law school and trying to do well in law school, and I'm working for the time. And so I got to the point where I just hit the wall, and I was just overwhelmed, and I just was like throwing up my hands and saying, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do this. And so I went to my Aunt Frances's house, who was like my third grandmother. Um, my, my dad was really a son to her. She was my paternal grandmother's sister, never married, didn't have children, so my dad was her son, and my brothers and I were her grandchildren, in effect, and loved her, I mean, loved her so much. She had finished Spelman, had taught all school, all of her professional life, making half the salary of white teachers in the Deep South. But I never heard her complain. She was a stoic woman, a very really tall, classy, stoic woman. And so I figured I'd go and talk to her. So I get in my little red Volkswagen and I drive to her house. And I get there and she could immediately tell that something was very wrong. I mean, I was just like distraught. And I curl up on her sofa and I'm just like whining and crying. Like, I just hate law school, I can't do it. I mean, I, 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 it's like all spastic and stuff. And, and she stopped me. And she said something to me that changed my life, Joe Jackson. She stopped me. And she said, Do you want to be over here? I couldn't even answer. I was so emotional, I couldn't even talk. I just nodded my head yes. And these are the words that I share with you as my gift to you today that changed my life. She said, baby, <laughs> if it were easy, everybody and their mom would be able to do it. But it's not easy and you have been uniquely blessed and situated to do what you set out to do. That's my gift to you today. Here set my one of my shoes. A woman who had seen the worst days of a segregated South, who had she had had a fraction of the opportunity.
opportunities that I have been blessed with. And here I was sitting there whining and complaining and didn't have to file a lawsuit, didn't have to pick it, didn't have to march. I was where I said I wanted to be. How dare I complain? And so I need to get my black ass, I said that, off that sofa and I needed to get on to do what I had set out to do. Now, law school didn't get no easier. It didn't get easier. You know, it did not get easier. What happened, though, is that when I got off that sofa that day, Mr. Chair, I had an anchor, a rod in my back. And I made a promise to myself that if there was ever anything that I set out to do that was important to me, I was going to figure out how to do it. Now I'll let you in on this. This was October. I had just started law school in office. <laughs> tell this story, but I needed to tell that story. Because there are going to be some hard places and some rough times. And there are going to be some hills that are going to seem that you can't climb. But it's not just about you. It's not just about you. You see, the plan was to go and talk to Aunt Francis, kind of get up my nerve to go across town and tell my mom and daddy I was dropping out of law school. How tragic that would have been. What if I'd given up on my dreams that day? Baby! <laughs> if it were easy. And so I've come to encourage you today. I've come to encourage you just like you heard from the brother chair. There are going to be times that people are going to try to discourage you. And trust and believe that there will be haters who are going to tell you all the reasons why you can't. And that's when you have to dig deep in your soul and remind yourself of why you can. Two grandmothers, maternal grandmother who, along with her sister, Aunt Frances, had gone to Spelman, K.O., and my mother's mother, who only had an elementary school education, in fact, I don't think Mama Barnes ever really finished elementary school. And both of them worked all of their lives as a domestic. I don't get it twisted. I know I am here because of God's grace and his mercy. I know that I am here because generations sacrifice for me to be able to stand in this place. And therefore, I owe a debt. I owe a debt to do the best I can, where I can, and when I can. Now, I'm not trying to put no guilt stuff on you, but if you are on the track to go to law school, you need to be really intentional about being, like, super intentional about that track. Because we need you. We need you. We need you. We need you to be committed. What did you say? Culturally conscious? I, I'm, I'm, you know, the first few times I use it, I'm going to give you credit, but then after that, it's mine. <laughs> Culturally conscious. Because everybody, I, keeping it real, everybody who shows up who's black is not culturally conscious. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> who will ride on the fact that you were black to get in law school and forget that you were black when you got out? you and lift you up in this 
So I've come to tell you, be not discouraged. Oh, I do? You, wait, wait. Usually Naima is going like this. In that case, can I tell you the story about Bertram's story? That's a good one. How jolly Marcus and Paul, mostly Paul. Let me introduce you to Naima. Naima is the general. Naima, stand up. Naima runs everything. Everything. You know, my son asked me a question, and I, was, and I looked at him and said, I don't know why I asked you. My mom just called my name, right? She runs everything, everything, everywhere, and I'm very, very grateful for her. And she'll be in staff meetings some days, and she'll start adding stuff. And, you know, we forget that she's not a warrior um, because she just, you know, she, she's just so incredible. I mean, she's amazing. <laughs> I'm proud to tell you that she's the president and CEO of Judge Linda Hatchet Worldwide, and I am grateful to have a young black woman running. <laughs> so, I'm often asked, what am I doing now, and then I'm going to tell you the story, and I really am going to be respectful of the time today. I have made the decision to step beyond the bench. And years ago, I actually, I have two sons. My younger of my two sons is a lawyer. And he kept saying, Mom, you need to start a law firm. I'm like, oh, why would I do that? You know, why would I do that? Um, for those of you who don't know, I was enormously blessed after Emory Law School. Actually, I went away to undergraduate school at Mount Holyoke. I was a part of that integration generation where they were sending black students to, to white schools. I mean, I'm just keeping it real. Because people say, well, why do you go to Spelman? Because I was a part of the integration generation. Worked for a year, came home back to Emory Law School as a story you've heard. But I was enormously blessed that after law school, I got to clerk for the first black federal judge in the Deep South, Judge Horace T. Ward. Now, I'm going to have to have a little time to tell that story quickly. And I was like, okay, I gave you 10 minutes, and now you're just going to get all out of it. Just go crazy with your 10 minutes. This is an important story. So, Horace Ward was the first plaintiff in the case to sue the University of Georgia for admission to the law school. Horace Ward, Horace T. Ward. Now let me tell you, Morehouse grad with honors, Atlanta University grad with honors, he didn't, he didn't get any better academically than Horace Ward. And he was from Georgia, he was from LaGrange, Georgia. Same place my daddy was from, right? <coughs> Brilliant man, he applies to, watch this, University of Georgia, and they're like, mm -mm, no, mm -mm, no. He said, why? And they were like, mm -mm. And so they said, look, 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 you're just not getting in. You're not getting in, you're black, you're not getting in. We don't, we don't accept black students. He says, but I've been a lifelong resident of the University of, of Georgia. I am entitled to go to law school here. They said, no. He filed a lawsuit. Guess who his lead attorney was on the lawsuit? Thurgood Marshall. Oh yeah, if you're gonna come, you may as well bring it. You may as well bring it. Thurgood Marshall was the lead attorney on the lawsuit because he was at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund at the time, all right? So watch this. Tell you, and you know, you don't go in the battle, you, got, you, you bring the best. Thurgood Marshall. So they filed a lawsuit. Mysteriously, Horace Ward gets drafted into the army. We were not in wartime. <laughs> <laughs> he comes out. They said, look, okay, let's, look, let's, let's just figure this out. We will pay your tuition 
to go anywhere in the country, just leave this alone. He said, no, I'm entitled to be here. I am qualified. In fact, he was overly qualified. For seven years, count them, seven years that lawsuit was pending. Right? So that's what I'm talking about. My Aunt Frances was looking at me. I didn't have to file a lawsuit to get in law school. Let's, let's, let's be real about this. But there are generations not that far removed who had to. So he files a lawsuit, they go to battle. Then in Federal District Court, Northern District of Georgia, Judge Moore rules against him. Right? And then he goes to Northwestern Law School, comes back, becomes a civil rights attorney, and becomes one of the attorneys that represented Dr. Martin Luther King in a number of matters. And I don't have time to tell you those stories right now. So as a civil rights lawyer, then he is the second black elected as a Georgia senator since Reconstruction, the first being Leroy Johnson. And he's in the trenches, he's working hard, and as God would have it, he's on the team that ultimately did win the desegregation case when Hamilton Holmes and Charlene Hunter, who is now Charlene Hunter Gall, get admitted to the University of Georgia. He was on the legal team that did that, and guess who their legal intern was in that lawsuit in those days? Vernon Jordan. Oh yeah, now I know my history now. I know my, I know my civil rights history. I, now, now I may not know a whole lot, I know that. So, years later, he gets appointed to the federal bench, Northern District of Georgia. Won't he do it? And I won't he win? Can I just be starting to write down a few things? Since I got a few things, I'm going to be quote on you. <laughs> Won't he will? So watch this. I get to be his very first law clerk. <laughs> Won't he will? Ah, I'm telling you. Won't he will? So the morning that he is sworn in, the courtroom is packed. Dignitaries from all over the country, civil rights leaders from all over the country, news media from everywhere, the foyer is, is packed. People are all outside the courthouse. It was a marvelous day. And I was there, right out of law school. And so Judge Ward does this. And I run up and I say, yes, sir, what do you need? And he said there was one seat, one seat in the entire courtroom that was empty, in the jury box on the front row, first seat. He said, take a seat. I said, oh no, sir, I'm good. I was just, I was just so grateful to be there. Here I am, you know, I'm way out of law school. I'm clerking in federal district court for the first black judge. I mean, I was just beside myself. Because you know, federal clerkships are like, well, you don't know yet, you can't go to law school. But, but, but clerkships are very rare, hard to get, and you know, people get their right pinky to have one. Right? So I'm like, okay. So fast forward the story, as he said, take a seat. I'm like, no, sir, I'm good. I'm good. He said, Glenda, I said sit down. <laughs> when I took a seat, and I get very emotional telling this story. When I took a seat that morning, I had a front row seat figuratively and literally to history. As he raised his right hand put his other hand on the Bible to take the oath of office, my young daughters and sons, I've come to tell you today that he took it in the same courtroom where decades before Judge Moore had denied his admission to the University of Georgia Law School. Tell me, Justice, maybe, Lawler, it bends in the directions of the 
the righteous. Won't he do it? And so won't he live? <laughs> and so as you do these applications, as you put a stake in the ground, understand that you're standing on the shoulders of mighty, 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 mighty generations who sacrificed for you to be able to be in law school. And once you're there, you understand that it's not just about you. That you gotta reach back. And you gotta make sure that others follow you. And so I end by just simply saying, be not discouraged. What is that favorite song by Grandmama? Um, they sang in Grandmama's church in Truth County, Georgia. But they didn't have no piano. It's just the old deacons humming. <laughs> Walk together, children. And don't you get weary. Run on and see what the end's going to be. So I say, walk together, my daughters and my sons. Be not discouraged. Understand that you stand on the generations of mighty, 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 mighty generations that make it possible for you to have these opportunities. Be not discouraged. Walk together, my children. Run on and see what the end will be facing the rising sun of a new day begun. Let us march on and on and on and on and on until the victory's won. I'm pulling for you, my children. Be blessed.